Mm. Ever notice how many times the Gospels tell us about Jesus eating with someone, but never drinking coffee with them? I think there's a deliberate oversight there that needs to be corrected someday. In the last video, I looked at why the Gospel authors thought Jesus' eating practices were so important. Today, I want to look at the powerful message that who and how Jesus ate sent. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible, and my name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and the research I've been doing in graduate institutions for the past 20 or 30 years and bring it to you on YouTube. This takes a lot of work, so if you enjoy these videos, please do me a favor, subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, and hit that share button and let a friend of yours or somebody you know know about this channel. Thank you very much. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus is invited to eat at one of the rulers of the Pharisees' houses. This man was a mover and shaker in the religious life of Israel. In Luke 7.35, Jesus was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In this passage, he's eating with a Pharisee, someone who took great care to make sure that they followed the law as a faithful response to God establishing his covenant with the nation of Israel. This is important to note. Luke takes great pains to show us Jesus eating and drinking with the most despicable and outcast members of society, tax collectors, drunks, prostitutes, and other sinners. Now he's eating and drinking with one of the most respected leaders within Israel. Jesus' eating practices span the spectrum from the respected to the despised, from the poor to the wealthy, from those on the fringes of society to those at the very center of it. And that's where our story today takes place. In chapter 14, verse 1, we are given the setting for this story. It takes place in a Pharisee's house, but also on the Sabbath. Now, this should immediately cause us to remember back to 1310, where Jesus healed in the synagogue on a Sabbath. And these two stories really seem to run parallel to each other. There's a lot of ideas and concepts repeated between the two stories. Then in verse 2, we have a huge gap in the story we suddenly have this man in front of Jesus. And we're not told how or why this man with Hudropikos is suddenly standing in front of Jesus. How did he get in there? Who let him in? Did he ask Jesus to heal him? Luke doesn't tell us any of that. Now we are told that this man is suffering from Hudropikos, that his limbs were filling with water, Hudros or Hydro, where we get hydroelectric from. Today we would call this edemia, if you're reading the King James Bible, it would be dropsy. It's usually caused by a deeper and more serious problem, heart failure, kidney problems, salt retention, deep vein thrombosis. But during Jesus' day, they didn't know about these other issues. They really saw the symptom as the main issue. And if his condition had progressed very far, he could possibly be oozing fluids right out of his skin. As a result, they would have seen him as unclean. In the ancient world, this disease of edemia, or hydropicos, was seen in a very negative light. Oftentimes, it is caused by a sodium imbalance. So the sufferer is constantly thirsty. They drink more, but then their limbs swell from the fluids. It's almost like they are cursed with a form of gluttony. The more they drink, the worse they are, and this makes them want to drink even more. Jesus then questions them whether it's right to heal on the Sabbath or not and they seem stuck for an answer. So Jesus heals the man and then uses the analogy that it's lawful to rescue a child or an animal that's fallen into a pit on the Sabbath. So why can't he rescue this man? Again, they remain silent. But the story of the healing of this man sets in motion three dialogues about meals within this chapter. The first one is in verses 7 to 11, the second is in verses 12 to 14, and then the third is the parable of the great feast in 15 through 24. Now we're just going to take a look at the first two of these interchanges. And if you're wondering about the parable of the great feast in verses 15 through 24, I have a complete video on that parable right up over here, the parable of the great feast in Luke 14. And I'll have a link to it up over here in the video or underneath in the show more section if that's something that interests you.
So at the very start on Jesus' teachings and interchanges about meals, he's already entered into controversy with those present. Now, he is not in direct conflict with them, just that they're not sure or they're not able to reply to his reasoning about healing this man. The thing to keep in mind here is that Jesus and Luke are not using these interchanges to teach us about table manners. Rather, they are using how we eat with others to reveal truths about God's kingdom. In the first interchange, in verses 7 through 11, Jesus observes how guests are picking out the places of honor at the meal, and he springboards off that to teach the guests at this meal. Then when Jesus noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. He said to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't take the place of honor, because a person more distinguished than you may have been invited by your host. So the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this man your place. Then ashamed, you will begin to move around to the least important place. But when you are invited, go and take the least important place, so that then when your host approaches, he will say to you, Friend, move up here to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who share the meal with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. A meal like this would have been eaten around a triclinium, and some of the best examples that we have preserved today come from the city of Pompeii. They vary quite a bit depending on the room and the house setup. But the basic idea here is that you would have had two or three raised platforms that sloped up in the middle that the guests would have reclined on. Feet would be on the outside, heads facing into the center. The food would have been served on plates or bowls on a table or a platform in the middle of the triclinium. The host usually sat at the very center, sort of the middle of the party. In this story, the guests are picking out the best seat throughout the triclinium. And Luke uses three different nouns to describe the different places here. The most important seat is the protoclesia or the first place to recline. The host probably took that place. In verse 9, we have a mention of the least important place, the eschaton topos, or the last or the least place. And finally, in verse 10, we have the better place, a neuteros. And this is a higher or a better place. So Luke and his readers would have been very familiar with how the seats were ranked around the table. It's in the middle of this that Jesus tells a parable. It's not really a parable, that's going to come later on in the chapter, but in this instance, it's more like a moral lesson. And it's based on the idea that the powerful shall be brought down and the humble shall be lifted up, that Mary, Jesus' mother, proclaimed in the Magnificat at the very start of Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 52 and 53. He brought down the mighty from their thrones, and he has lifted up those of lowly position. He has filled the hungry with good things, and he has sent the rich away empty. Jesus summarizes this idea in verse 11, where it says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself shall be exalted. Notice how Jesus directly ties something so mundane as picking out the seats around the table with kingdom values. In verses 7 through 11, Jesus is primarily addressing the guests at the table. In verses 12 through 14, he now turns his attention to the host and offers him some instruction as well. Luke 14, 12 through 14 reads, He said to the man who had invited him, When you host a dinner or a banquet, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, so you can be invited by them in return and get repaid. But when you host an elaborate meal, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And I'm reading from the New English Translation today. Jesus takes the values of the kingdom and applies them to this meal. The host is to invite the poor, sick, and unclean to their meals. These people cannot repay you, and you can't get any reward from them during this life. But God does not allow these things to slide by unnoticed. In the life to come, they will be rewarded for the way they ministered to those who are overlooked in this life. What is really interesting here is that these ideas are not unique to Jesus. Marshall, who lived somewhere between 40 and 100 AD, 
was a scathing satirist. And when talking about being invited to a big or significant meal like Jesus was, he ridiculed his host for how he ranked his guests. Marshall writes, Since I am asked to dinner, why is it not the same fare served to me as to you? You take oysters fattened in the Lucerne Lake. I suck a mussel through the hole in the shell. You get mushrooms? I take hog funguses. You tackle turbo? but I brill. Golden with fat, a turtle dove gorges you with its bloated rump. There is set before me a magpie that has died in its cage. Why do I dine without you, although, Ponticus, I am dining with you? Let me eat the same fare. Pliny the Younger, who lived from around 61 to 113 AD, also criticized how ranking and honor was shown during a meal. And he was a governor in northern Turkey, sort of along the coast of the Black Sea today. He writes about attending a meal and his discussion with one of the other guests there. Pliny writes, I happened to be dining with a man, though no particular friend of his, whose elegant economy, as he called it, seemed to me a sort of stingy extravagance. The best dishes were set in front of himself and a select few and the cheap scraps of food before the rest of the company. He had even put the wine into tiny flasks, divided into three different categories, not with the idea of giving his guests the opportunity of choosing, but to make it impossible for them to refuse what they were given. One lot was intended for himself and us, another for his lesser friends, and all of his friends are graded, and a third for his and our freedmen. My neighbor at the table noticed this and asked me if I approved. I said I did not. So what do you do, he asked. I serve the same to everyone. For when I invite guests, it is for a meal, not to make class distinctions. I have brought them as equals to the same table, and so I give them the same treatment and everything. Even the freedmen? Of course, for they are my fellow diners, not freedmen. That must cost you a lot. On the contrary, how is that? Because my freedmen do not drink the sort of wine I do, but I drink theirs. Now notice how Pliny, a governor, is leveling the playing field when it comes to meals around a triclinium. Hmm. I should have a whole banquet set out here before me so I can make a class distinction. You could watch me eating this gorgeous feast while you had to just watch over YouTube at home. But I digress. During the time of Christ, meals were much more than just eating food. Relationships were established over meals, who was in and who was outside of the network. But they also reflected your standing within society. If you were honored, the question then became how much and in relationship to who at that table. And if you had no social standing within society, like the poor, the lame, and the blind, then you were not invited to meals like this. For the original readers of the Gospels, this would have been hard food to swallow. To practice table fellowship as Jesus did would have cut them off socially from their family, friends, and business networks. Jesus takes what appeared to be widespread criticism of meal practices and social hierarchies and how they were acted out around a table and used them to reinforce his teachings about the kingdom. The poor and the outcast members that were members of the church would have been very familiar with how they have been treated or not treated to meals. The criticisms that Marshall and Pliny leveled against these practices would have been part of their lived experiences. However, Jesus just doesn't criticize how a person eats. He takes those values and twists them. And in doing so, he illuminated the nature of the values within the kingdom of God and how those who will eat within the kingdom of God should then live their lives here now. You've been invited to this feast where the mighty are pulled down and the humble are exalted. Now the question is, how will you reflect those values within your life, who you eat with, and how you eat with them? I'm going to close with a reply that one of the other guests at this meal that the roar of the Pharisees hosted because it seems so appropriate. In Luke 14, 15, this guest says, 
Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Till next week, peace.